Warning, some of the following images are graphic in nature and might be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Elizabeth Pina and Jenny Erdman were close friends who attended Waltrip High School together. On June 24, 1993, at 4.15 p.m., Jenny Erdman's father, Randy, drove his only daughter to Elizabeth's home. At approximately 8 p.m., Elizabeth's mother, Melissa, then drove the two girls to the home of their friend, Gina Escamilla, who lived in the Spring Hill Apartments and was having a pool party with friends from school. As the girls were getting out of the car, Elizabeth assured her mother she and her friend would be home by their agreed time of 11.30 p.m. However, when the pair realized they would be late returning home, they decided to leave the party to make sure they made it back by curfew. Jenny and Elizabeth agreed to take a 10-minute shortcut to Elizabeth's home in Oak Forest by following the railroad tracks and then passing through T.C. Jester Park. The location of this park was approximately one mile from Elizabeth's home. The girls walked along the White Oak Bay when they encountered six black and white gang members casually drinking beer. Black and White was the name of the gang. The gang's members included Sean Derrick O'Brien, Jose Madeline, Venancio Medellins, a 14-year-old minor, Efren Perez, Raul Villarreal, a freshly initiated member, and the group's leader, Peter Cantu. Raul had not been a member of the black and white gang or any gang, but had engaged in this initiation ceremony. During that initiation, he had been forced to fight several gang members for five minutes successively before they decided whether they would accept him or not. By approximately 10.30 p.m., Raul had successfully fought two gang members before being beaten to the ground midway through his fight with the third member, Minutes later, the leader of the gang, Peter Anthony Cantu, approached Raul, exclaiming, You're in. Dude, you're a badass. You're welcome to hang with us anytime. Raul then sat with several other gang members, relaxing, talking, trading insults and compliments, and drinking beers. Within approximately 40 minutes, Raul accepted several bottles of beer from the other gang members, and, holding his first beer in his hands, Jenny and Elizabeth passed the gang. One member, Jose Medellin, attempted to grope and pinch one of Elizabeth's breasts. Elizabeth brushed aside Medellin's hand and continued walking. In response, Medellin said, No, baby, where are you going? He then clasped his arm around Pina's neck, threw her to the ground, and dragged her down a gravel decline in the direction of the other gang members. As Elizabeth screamed and pleaded for help, she was then forced to remove her underwear. Jenny could have quickly run away to escape at this point, but she decided to run back to help her friend. Unfortunately, that meant she was thrown to the ground by gang members Peter Cantu and Derek Sean O'Brien. Five of the gang members proceeded to rape both girls for over an hour. Both girls were sexually assaulted by all but one of the gang members, 14-year-old Venancio Uni Medellin. On a minimum of four occasions, according to trial testimony, both Elizabeth and Jenny repeatedly glanced in the direction of one another several times throughout their ordeal in likely gestures of concern and despair. Both continually struggled against their abusers, with Elizabeth attempting to fight off her attackers on at least one occasion by repeatedly kicking her legs, and Jenny biting her attackers. According to later testimony, on one occasion, Elizabeth glanced in the direction of her younger friend as she herself was raped by Ephraim. Elizabeth began weeping as she observed Jenny. In court, the gang members' confessions showed that at least two individuals were raping the girls at once, and they were raped vaginally. During a brag session, one of the members said they raped them orally and anally for over an hour. According to one of the gang members, when he finally got to her, she was loose and sloppy, but another gang member said he was happy having virgin blood on him. Madeline was running to Peter and his brother, trying to convince them to leave, but Peter kept telling him to take some. So he broke down and raped Jennifer. Realizing that the girls would be capable of identifying them, Peter Cantu, the leader of the gang, ordered the members to kill the girls. Leading the girls into nearby woods, despite their cries, begs, and attempts to negotiate for their lives, both girls were strangled to death. Following Peter Cantu's initial instruction, he first shouted, get on your knees, bitch, to Jenny. Sean O'Brien and Raul then proceeded to strangle Jenny with a red nylon belt before the belt broke. Both then completed the act by strangling the girl with a shoelace in Elizabeth's presence. As Jenny was murdered, Elizabeth was forced to watch her friend's death as other gang members held a ligature around her neck. 
At first, Elizabeth desperately attempted to appease her abusers as she wept, offering to provide her phone number in order that they could get together. She then attempted to flee. In response, Peter Cantu repeatedly kicked the girl in her face and body, dislodging three of her teeth and fracturing several ribs. Peter Cantu, Jose Medellin, and Perez then strangled Elizabeth to death with a pair of shoelaces. The gang members then stomped on both girls' throats to ensure their deaths. Leaving the crime scene, Peter Cantu handed Venancio Medellin a goofy wristwatch taken from Jenny's body, saying, Take this. I don't want it. Peter Cantu dropped off Jose Medellin, Efrain Perez, and Raul at his residence, where he lived with his brother, Joe Cantu, and sister-in-law, Christina Cantu. Christina Cantu questioned why Raul was bleeding and Perez had a bloody shirt. This prompted Medellin to say the gang had fun and that details would appear on the news. He then elaborated that he had raped both girls. Peter Cantu then returned and divided the valuables that had been stolen from the girls. Jose Medellin got a ring with an E so he could give it to his girlfriend. Esther, Medellin reported that he had killed a girl and noted that he would have found it easier with a gun. O'Brien was videotaped smiling at the scene of the crime. After the gang left, Christina Cantu convinced Joe Cantu to report the crime to the police because she felt bad for the girls and their families. Joe then gave a tip to Crime Stoppers anonymously about what had happened and where they could find the bodies. The bodies were discovered on June 28, 1993, four days after the girls' deaths. Randy Edman, the father of Jennifer Edman, was preparing to talk with a reporter about his daughter's disappearance. When he observed an officer announced that they had found two bodies through the police scanner. Then, Randy Eltman took control of the news van and drove to where the victims were. As he got there, he ran over and screamed, does she have blonde hair? Thankfully, authorities were able to pull him away from the horrific scene. However, the brutality of the rape stunned the entire county of Houston. The medical examiner testified that Elizabeth's two front teeth were knocked out of her head before she passed away because their bodies were so decomposed. Their dental records had to be utilized for identification. Jennifer's ribs were fractured, and some of her teeth had been knocked out by Peter Cantu with his steel toe boots before she passed away. Hardened police officers began to cry when they observed the girl's remains. All the gang members were apprehended and sentenced to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Sean Derrick O'Brien, Efren Perez, and Peter Cantu were given the death penalty. Although the Supreme Court of the United States prohibited the execution of those who committed their crimes while underage, this commuted Perez's and real sentences to life in prison. Venancio Madeline, 14, who did not participate in the murder but did in the rape, was sentenced to a maximum of 40 years in prison because he was a minor. Sean O'Brien was the first to be executed in July 2006. His final words to the victim's families watching his execution were, I'm sorry, I have always been sorry. O'Brien said, holding his head up and looking straight. At relatives of his victims, it is the worst mistake that I have ever made in my whole life, not because I am here, but because of what I did and I hurt a lot of people, you and my family. He repeated again and again that he was sorry. Six months before killing Jennifer and Elizabeth, evidence connected O'Brien to another homicide. However, he was never charged. The body of 27-year-old Patricia Lopez was discovered in a Houston park. She had been raped too. A beer can with O'Brien's fingerprints was discovered beneath the woman's body, linking this murder to it as well. Jose Madeline, who was executed in 2008, attempted to appeal by claiming his status as an international figure. He was born in Mexico and argued that he should have been allowed assistance from the Mexican consulate. Before the trial, meddling's impending execution became an international controversy. Since the state did not hold a hearing about whether the inability of meddling to meet with Mexican consular officials harmed his defense, both families of Jennifer and Elizabeth were strongly in favor of his execution. Before he was given lethal injection, his final words were this, I'm sorry that my actions brought you pain. I hope this brings the closure to what you seek. Don't ever hate them for what they do never harbor hate. The last one of the gang members to be executed was the leader Peter Cantu. He was executed in 2010 on August 17th. He offered no words of apology or remorse before dying. Due to the brutality of this case, the state of Texas made two significant policy changes. First, Judge Bill Harmon allowed Jennifer's father, Randy Ertman, to speak with Peter Cantu directly, which was unusual for courts to permit family members to do before. 
Second, the policy regarding watching executions was changed. This case was crucial in changing Texas law so that family members who had been murdered may watch their killers perish. And Pina, Elizabeth's father, believed that the rapist's deaths were too wonderful for them. Put it this way, I wish my daughter could have died the way he died today wasn't any pain compared to the pain these girls went through an awful lot of pain when they died, said Pina, who was wearing a white t-shirt with a photo of the two girls printed on the front. When asked about Peter Cantu's silence, he said this, there's nothing he would have said to me that would have made any difference. He did a horrendous crime to these two girls, and he deserved to die, and 17 years later, he died not soon enough. 17 years is a long time to have something eating on you like that. We think about those girls every day. And this, my friends, is the sad case of Jenny and Elizabeth. Don't forget to sub and comment down below your thoughts on this case.